Um, so I'm going to make this a lot easier for everyone. I don't use a PowerPoint. Um, and that's because in the work that I've done over the last 30 years, um, the most successful presentations I usually give are the ones that I give um, from my own experience. And using a PowerPoint, I think, is really helpful um, when you have a lot of technical information to share. But what I'm going to share with you today is something that's just at the beginning. Um, so I don't have slides, but I'd like to share with you um, a little bit about the work that we're doing with Doctrid, which is the Daughters of Charity um, Technology and Research um, Institute uh, for people with disabilities. It's an Irish-led institute, um, but it's an international um, partnership between Michigan State University um, here in the United States and um, Irish educational institutions. But let me back up for a minute because what our panel really wanted to talk about was building research capacity. And over this past day and a half, what's really struck me is that we haven't really focused on voice and choice. I think that all of the research capacity that we build has to be able to reflect the voice of people with disabilities and their choices around things like technology. So in my presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we plan to do, but I'm more interested in starting a dialogue so that as we build our research agenda, that we really look at the input of um, individuals in low and middle resource countries and that we allow people with disabilities to drive that research agenda. Um, just a couple things. One of the, one of the speakers earlier today um, was talking about the technology that we now have available to us with cell phones. And I reflected on my experience almost 20 years ago in Zimbabwe. And I was in a very rural, very remote area of Zimbabwe. And this was an area that did not have um, electricity, didn't have running water, but people had cell phones. And I think that that really has to drive how we see access to technology and how we need to drive the price of technology down so that people can continue to um, access applications and utilize the resources that can be available through um, cell phone technology and mobile technology. Um, I'm also, as I was introduced, a member of the National Council on Disability here in the United States. And one of our members is a disabled veteran, and he is committing his future to open source devices that are prosthetic devices. So he wants to be able to take prosthetic device and prosthetic device technology out to everyone in an open source environment so that people, regardless of where you are, will be able to reverse engineer um, prosthetic devices and be able to take a look at what could you make available if it were available by open source. And so I just encourage us all to be thinking about what's, what's the future. And if we want to build a research capacity, then let's be looking at what's that field-initiated research that we want to see be developed. So I'm actually going to um, talk a little bit about our research institute that is being Irish-led. Um, but it really was designed as a coalition of scholars and universities dedicated to improving the quality of life of individuals with intellectual disabilities and autism. And they invited me to serve as the chair of their International Advisory Committee. So I would encourage us as we look at research capacity, we look at how do we engage people with disabilities 
and I am a person with a disability. How do we engage people with disabilities in how we build our research agenda, how we evaluate the projects that we initiate, and how we build um, what we see as those strategic investments in the future? Um, in March, we had a chance to bring together um, a group of uh, folks from around the world at a symposium that was um, a part of a European Union science um, conference, and it was a global science conference. And we put together um, a day and a half of a symposium to be able to bring folks together who could talk about what was happening with assistive technology around the world. And we have presenters from Japan and from Haiti and from the United States and from Ireland and the United Kingdom. But we lacked the ability to bring people from low and middle income countries to that table. And so part of what we're doing with building a global consortium around assistive technology is to really invite the participation of folks from across the globe and really look at how can we translate what we know about assistive technology so that it is a benefit to people in low and middle resource countries. Because I think that needs to drive, again, the voice and the choice um, and be reflected in the research capacity that we build. Um, we have, right now, at Michigan State University, um, we funded three postdoc research fellows who are going to spend part of their time um, over the next three years, part of their time in the United States at Michigan State University, and part of their time at research-based um, organizations, whether it's a university or a technology company in Ireland. And the way that the program is being developed right now is that the three research fellows have been selected, and they'll start their work in July, but their projects have not been developed yet. So they will be placed with institutions in Ireland and they will build their project as they do their fellowship. That's in contrast to funding the, um, the Irish um, Research Institute doctorate was able to get from uh, Marie Curie um, with the EU funding, where they're going to fund 20 fellows that will start next year, and then another 20 fellows that will start the year after that. And they will come in as fellows with their projects already identified. They will identify the organization that they're going to work with, um, their EU-based um, institution or US-based institution, and then the work that they will do in Ireland. So we'll have two different approaches, one with three fellows who will develop their projects um, now that they are fellows, and then a total of 40 additional fellows that will come in with projects already identified and start their research from there. Um, a couple things I wanted to share is that we're looking at what are some of the cross-cutting research themes and issues that we'll be able to focus on. And again, thinking about where I've done the most of my work has been in independent living and employment, I'm going to continue to push for um, work that's real in terms of the research work that allows us to really look at what will it take using assistive technology to really improve employment outcomes for people with disabilities um, globally in low and middle income countries and throughout the world. Um, some of the areas that we've looked at that we think are really rich for um, research capacity building, one is in evidence-based assessment and diagnostics. And so I can envision that we will look at research around technology-based interventions that um, assist transitioning youth 
So what can we learn with assessments and diagnostics about what happens when youth transition from um, secondary education to employment? Um, what happens when you have the provision or the lack of provision of accommodations? And um, what do we learn in terms of evidence-based assessment and diagnostics? Um, another area is evidence-based treatments and interventions. And so a lot of the focus of this conference is on technology-based interventions. So what will we learn by the provision of um, accessible applications? What will we learn when we know more about how to assist in communicating with people that are nonverbal? What will we learn about the kinds of interventions that really make a difference in the quality of life for a person, um, regardless of where they are around the world. Um, we're also going to look at probably lifespan developmental issues. So a couple of the presenters over this past day and a half have talked about looking at um, both early intervention as well as the other side of the spectrum of the aging population. So we know that disability impacts us across, across our lifespan. Um, I've been impacted all of my life because I was born with my disability. But we're going to have the aging of our um, populations really impact what will we look at for technology development to assist someone who's older um, to stay in their own home or um, to be able to get access to information um, like what we learned about in Bolivia. How can we start to use technology and technology access um, across the lifespan? Um, when I see videos of young children who are now using smartphones and the technology that's available to us. Um, and we're just at the beginning of learning what the potential is for that. Um, another area I think that will be ripe for research is around family, societal, and environmental issues. So how do we look at what we can do with technology to disseminate evidence-based practices? And I think that being able to look at environmental issues and the impact of um, the environment to what the person's access is. Um, we saw a picture of a young woman who was transporting water um, in her village and she had to go um, a long distance to be able to get the water from the well to her home. And the way she was able to do that was to put the vessel um, on her lap and use her wheelchair to um, be able to make that work for her. So we're going to look at, I hope, both with family and societal, but also environmental issues. And um, another area I think is epidemiology. I um, know a lot about comorbidity and when you have the existence of one disabling condition and then you have um, the existence of other um, disabling conditions. So what's the impact to the person's life? So I think that there's a lot of work that we want to do. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to really build a research agenda that allows us to use the skills and talents of um, postdoctoral students. But I think it has to be guided by people with disabilities, and it has to be guided by both their voice and their choice. Um, we intend, through the um, International Institute that I'm working with, to have a global consortium on assistive technology because we really think there's an opportunity to um, share information on best practices as well as to um, impact the way that information is shared um, about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I think that by utilizing technology, we're going to figure out a way to share that information and the 
as a result is that more people with significant disabilities are going to have a better quality of life. And so I think that's what brings me to all of this work. Um, I've had a wonderful time over this past day and a half um, connecting with people that um, I've known throughout my career. Um, and I think that by building a global consortium, um, we have that opportunity to extend those relationships, but also to prompt each other to think about the kind of research topics that are really going to make a difference. Um, so I'm going to close by just saying that I think the, the driver for all of the work that we're going to do together is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we need to seize the day. We need to look at, in your country, are you a part of making sure that your country not only signs but ratifies the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? And once it has been signed and once it has been ratified, are you a part of implementing the changes that need to take place um, in the way people with disabilities are included um, in everyday life, whether that's in housing or transportation or procurement or community development or economic development. Um, there's a real opportunity for us to utilize the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to really further our agenda. And I would encourage folks to take a very active role in that. So I'm going to close there. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Vanessa, for your presentation. I've already listened to